Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Nuts and Bolts with Marquines. My hey name everyone. is Maria and today we're going to talk about purple or violet <laughs> right. as the third video in the sequence on secondary and tertiary colors. So if you haven't seen any of these episodes before, go back and then you will have um, a sequence of of videos on the primary colors and now secondary and tertiary. So it's the last video of this sequence. It's the last video of 2020. We're completing the color wheel, circle. Yes, in a way. <laughs> so, okay, talk to us about purple or violet. First, is there a difference between purple and violet? Is it the same color? It's a great question. And I really want to recommend this, put another plug, Maria, for this mm -hmm. book. It's called uh, Chromophilia, the story of color in art. I absolutely love this book. It's got a lot of chapters on the history of color and associations. So in my research, I discovered for the first time that purple is a color leaning towards red and that violet is a color leaning towards blue. Okay. But I, in my courses, have always just used the word violet mm -hmm. and then I use the word blue violet and red okay. violet to connote that phenomenon. Okay. But there's the difference. So let's talk about the color purple. I love purple. Ah. I love purple. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because, again, in my research, I discovered that purple or violet, of all the colors, has a very strong, people have a very strong feeling about color, about purple, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. They either love, love it or they <laughs> don't. Yeah, it's a love hate thing. There's okay. not a whole lot of middle ground. Violet or purple is the color of wealth historically, mm -hmm. the color of royalty, royalty yeah. the color of wealth and prestige and power going all the way back. And part of that, Maria, has to do with how difficult it was to get that color, mm. to achieve that color. It was expensive? It was extremely expensive, much like ultramarine blue, another very expensive color. Mm -hmm. uh, and the colors always came from natural, the natural world, mm -hmm. either floral or fauna. In this case, the earliest records of violet or purple came from a gland found in a sea snail. And it would take 10,000 wow. sea snails, okay, to excrete enough extract for one gram of violet or purple. So okay. that's, that's, uh... that makes sense that the artist would have to pay that much more for a color and the patrons would pay that much more to have purple or violet in. So I guess it makes sense to mix it rather than extracting <laughs> ten blends of 10,000 snails. Well, you see a red and a blue. And they'd have to get ultramarine blue to do that, you yes. see, so there's that. Well, it's fun because we're gonna be talking about mixing purples with different reds and blues, and not all reds and blues will give us obviously the same purple yes. or purple at all. So I, it's it's fun. We'll right. see that later. So that's interesting to to think about that in terms of associations going all the way back. Mm -hmm. So the those are the positive associations historically of violet and purple as wealth, royalty, etc., class, stature. The negative connotation has to do the pushback it's against the that. Yes, um, <laughs> I can see that. You know, it's the democratic notion of pushing back against um, arrogance, condescension, your your sense of prestige privilege. or or power or privilege. Mm -hmm. And so, for that reason, there's been a sort of adverse feeling historically mm -hmm. about violet or purple. Who knows how this carries through in time? Uh, can I quickly share my story with Irma Cavett, my mentor, about sure. violet? Yeah. So I personally am not a fan of violet. I'm just going to state that as yeah. a color in my work. Just never have been. And this might go back to my days as an undergraduate student. Irma Cavett was my first mentor at UC Santa Barbara, one of them. And we did a lot of copies and studies from masters. And it occurred to me after the end of the first year, Maria, that we never were using violet or purple. And I said to, uh, to Irma, I said, hey, Irma, how come we're not using violet? And she goes, because you can't handle it. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So tough color to, quote, handle. Hmm. I used to use purple a lot for shading for darkening colors instead mm -hmm. of black I would use a really dark purple mm -hmm. what do you use purple for how do you use it in your painting what I really love purple for is mixing it into the various yellows yellow greens mm. yellows yellow oranges and then I mix with the red violets and the violets and the blue violets and I get this enormous oh my god the compliments which we'll do on future videos yep. So I use it for that reason. Okay. Now, but you don't use purple per se in your paintings. Very rarely do I throw 
purple or violet into mm. a painting per se. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it just, it, it, it kind of steals the show for me, you know, in, in the midst of other colors. And Any so- Any artists that you know that did use lots, purple? Lots, lots and lots. Oh, give us a few. Sure. Uh, Michelangelo was one of the first uh, Renaissance uh, artists to use purple in a way to sculpt form, not just to say this is royalty, but to really use it to sculpt with. Mm -hmm. um, but moving into the 19th century, the artists who really celebrated uh, violet and purple were the Impressionists, mm -hmm. led by Monet. Mm -hmm, Monet yes. was the biggest fan of purple. And in fact, in Violet, I've got a quote here from him, and it says here, Quote, this is Monet, I have finally discovered the true color of the atmosphere. It's violet. Fresh air is violet. Three years from now, everyone will work in violet. So <laughs> <laughs> Monet loved his violets. We'll give you some examples of that. But many of the other Impressionists played with violet and purple quite a bit. Then moving into the 20th century, latter part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century, Gustav Klimt. Mm beautiful paintings celebrating violet and purple. And um, speaking of Klimt, that brought to mind uh, Hilga Ath Klimt, with an N, um, and a remarkable woman painter, a uh, female painter, excuse me, of the 19th, early 20th century. So we'll show you some examples of her use of violet. It's very different from Klimt. Mm -hmm. They're much more feminine, much mm -hmm. lighter, much more, I don't know, ephemeral use of violet. Uh, Mark Rothko used violet beautifully and purple, uh, juxtaposed to other colors. Um, and that's all, it's always about juxtaposition of other colors, obviously. And Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, you know, one of many, I'm seeing just a tip of the yeah. iceberg, but Georgia O'Keeffe did some beautiful floral studies celebrating uh, violet. And they're very sensual and very sensuous, even erotic. So um, those are some artists that come to my mind. So I would really be curious to hear about your experiences with purple. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of purples do you use? Do you mix them? Do you buy them out of the tube? Oh, before we sign off, I do want to mention that there are some wonderful violets and purples you can get right out of the tube. Cobalt violet is one of my favorites, and there's a number of them. So I'm not suggesting that you must always mix with red and blue. I sometimes do that. I'll go to a tube if I need a certain violet that I want to use to mix with other colors. Okay, so for this video, we're going to mix some purples. We're going to mm -hmm. jump onto the mixing table and uh, experiment a little bit. Invite you to experiment with us. So let's go check it out. All right then. So let's get into the mixing of violet or purple. When people think, oh, let me mix a violet, they're going to grab a red and they're going to grab a blue. The difficulty is what red and what blue, it really makes a difference. So that's what I wanna discuss with you folks right now. My kind of go-to favorite is, in terms of reds, is either alizarin crimson, which I enjoy, but also uh, quinacridone crimson comes really close to it. They're just, I think the alizarin crimson's a little bit darker, but they're both really wonderful. And also primary magenta can also create some lovely violets and purples, all right? So I'm gonna go right now with the alizarin crimson, which is here. And by the way, when you put a color out, it really helps to kind of smear it out on the palette. You can see it much more clearly. That's just a big tip in general. I always like to do that. When you see it in a clump, it's hard to really read its uh, hue. And which blue do you have here? So what I have, and I will, let's talk about blue. So that's the reds. Um, the blue is an ultramarine blue, and that can make a big difference too in the violets and purples that you're able to achieve if you want real saturation and vibrancy, okay, intensity, if you will. If you use other blues, like a phthalo blue or a cobalt blue, they're not going to give you as intense of violets and purples. They're more dull, quite more dull. However, another really good blue, and I've got it out here just to show folks, is this blue here, and this is anthraquinone blue. It really makes a really nice violet as well. So I'm just keeping things simple for our demo, and I'm sticking with the alizarin crimson and the ultramarine blue. All right. And make... then for comparison, I think you put out that. So this is why I put red. out. This is a this is a cad red light, mm -hmm. and the reason I'm doing this is to show how very different it is when you grab one red versus another. Uh, the point here 
is that this red on the color light spectrum is already leaning towards violet, whereas this red, CAD red light, is leaning towards orange, and you're gonna get a much more dull, even brown version. Violet is the darkest color on the light spectrum. So when you mix your reds and blues, automatically that color is gonna go quite dark. And sometimes it's very hard to see what you get. So we're gonna be mixing for a red violet and a blue violet, but I'm also gonna to try to get a violet that's a secondary color, you see. The red violet is a tertiary color, as is the blue violet, and trying to get that sweet spot of a violet that's secondary is tricky business, but we're gonna do that as well. So Maria, in this first column, what I've done here is I've made a note. I've got a lizard crimson plus the ultramarine blue. And in this case, I throw just a little bit of the ultramarine blue into the lizard crimson to get a red violet. Now there's any number of red violets that I can get, but that's what I've done. Then to that mixture, I've added white three times because it always is good to reveal. Look how it is dark here before I scrape against the paper. That's how dark it is. It's almost nearly impossible to see what color you've got when you lay it down thick. Right, now so I'm gonna, I'm now I'm gonna go to the blue violet next. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna reverse this. I'm gonna add just a small amount of the um, lizard crimson into the ultramarine blue. That's how I'm gonna get a nice strong blue violet. That's the next mixture. And because it goes so dark, one of the things you can do is just kind of smear it around, on the, in this case, on the glass to see what you got. But it only takes, and it's, it's, this is the tricky part, everybody, about mixing your violets, is that they go so dark so quickly. All right, let's see what we have here. The main thing is to make sure that it's different from just the blue straight out of the tube, which, which this will be. So there's my blue violet. Look how dark that Very is. Very dark. It's almost right. black. Right. And so that's why when I'm experimenting and making notes and things, I like to scrape the way the paper. Mm -hmm. You see that, how it reveals? And look how different. You can really see there's a blue violet and there's a red violet. So very useful when you're experimenting to scrape. Of course, the other way to reveal it is to add white. And I always like to add white at least two or three times to reveal that color's temperature but also in painting, you want to have lots of variety of value. So here's a half tone, and I'll go a couple more times here quickly. There's that. Doesn't take long to experiment here. Also, get an even mixture. There's that. And then finally one more time for the lightest value. A lot of painters, I feel, uh, fail to really exploit what I call the off-whites, which are these really beautiful, very high-key colors. All right, so there's my blue violet. So now in mixing, trying to get a violet that sits in between, that's the second, excuse me, tertiary color, red violet, tertiary blue violet, trying to get one that sits right in between is tricky business. So Maria, it took me uh, three tries to get to the right violet. You can see I'm experimenting by doing this. And here we go. This violet is cooler than this one here, which is a red violet. And yet this violet also warmer than this blue violet, which means it's a pretty good secondary violet. And you can also see the difference when I'm adding white. It's cooler than this, but warmer than that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now let's see what we get when we use this red. <laughs> I'm already scared. Great. I love the, I just love the, uh, the surprise, always a surprise with color. So here's a huge difference, everybody. And here's what we did. As I mentioned before, sometimes a person will just grab a red and grab a blue and say, oh, let me make violet. Well, guess what? Depends on the red and blue. So here we have, as we said earlier, that cad red light with the ultramarine blue. And my so-called red violet really is more it's of a brown. brown color, you see. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that this is a much more uh, muted or even chromatic gray version, if you will, of violet, you see. Uh, it is on the spectrum moving into the category, the terrain of violet, but in much less uh, saturated yeah. or intense fashion. Then when I decide to mix a so-called blue violet, 
which is right here. Again, quite dark in there and it's gray. What it really looks very close to, Maria, is a Payne's gray, which I love Payne's gray. It looks almost like an achromatic gray. It almost like reaches almost. an achromatic gray, which is, is the kind of gray you get with just white and black. Mm -hmm. Now the point I wanna make here is that even though these colors here, particularly this one, is not an intense or saturated violet, it can be a very beautiful color. And I sometimes like to go there with my browns. I might say, well, instead of a brown out of a tube, let me grab a cad red and throw a certain blue in there and I'll get a nice rich brown. So there are many variations on these colors that you can achieve. Okay, so here's the page of our little experimentation marks, little tests here. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to say to wrap it up? Any tips or Well, thoughts? generally speaking, as I've always said, the way to really understand color and color relationships is to experiment, to experiment, to experiment. And uh, in our new series coming up around the corner in the new year, we'll start playing around with complements of colors mm -hmm. and what you can achieve with uh, complementary colors, which we'll dive into in the new year. So yes, it's all about experimentation, trial and error. And one last thing, Maria, I always say to the artists that I'm working with, do not look at this endeavor as a chore. I look at it as a meditation. Mm. And if you come at it with that perspective, it's much more enjoyable. And just for the very end of this video, since this is the last video of this year, mm. just to take a moment to wish you a happy new year. Yes. Uh, all the best in 2021, hopefully is going to be much better than this year. <laughs> Has to be. Has to be. And um, stay in touch, uh, get on the newsletter if you haven't done so, subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so, check out Mark's website at markeens.com for upcoming workshops mm -hmm. and um, everything that is coming up. I don't know what's going to be coming up in 2021, but hopefully we will have some sort of in-person events, hopefully. So I think so. Stay this, in touch. This will pass and we'll be seeing you in person. Stay in touch and all the best. All right. Be well. Bye-bye.